I honestly wrestled with this. I can't believe it when I think back. Is this the first game that you make on your own? Yeah. What? I interviewed Warren Davis, the creator of Qbert, and he has an incredible story to tell about how he almost skipped out on the entire game industry. I was just really over it, so I quit. Without the tools he created, that means no more combat, no Qbert, no NBA Jam. Oh my God, it was it was insane. These are crazy classics from Midway's resurgent in the early 90s. Williams was an unbelievable place. It was a powerhouse. And what's crazy about it is he was this close to it almost not happening. I kind of was so disillusioned with engineering at that point, I thought, I quit. If you created one of the most iconic arcade games of all time, would you continue making games or would you let that success go to your head? We were just trying to make the coolest shit. Today, I'm trying to get Warren to reveal his secrets about what made him so successful and what made him a titan of the industry. Take me back to a young Warren Davis yeah. in 1977. 1977, I don't think I was that young. I think I was 21. <laughs> <laughs> no, 1977 is when I graduated from uh, college with a bachelor's degree in computer and systems engineering. The plan was for me to stay and uh, get my master's degree. This is at a, a RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And so after you got your degree in electrical engineering, well, I didn't get my degree. I, oh, you... I stayed, but I didn't get my degree. Oh, well, what happened there? My thesis project was going to be related to the Mars rover. In the 1970s, NASA had a bunch of universities working on developing Mars rovers. One of the things they wanted to put on it was graphical capability, eyesight, if you want to, if you will. And I was interested in computer graphics, and I wanted my master's thesis to be something involved with computer graphics. So I was told that there was a graphical element to this project where uh, it was going to be shooting out lasers and getting reflections back, and then I would have to like somehow be drawing what it sees. Well, when I got there, when I actually started the project, it turned out all of that work had already been done the previous year. What? They, did they lie to you? or yeah. they just, Or did they not know? No, they, they, the, the professor just lied. They were just like, oh, here's a young student. Let's get him in here. Let's I have no idea. I couldn't tell else. you. I don't know why. <laughs> All I know is I got there and the graphic part had already been done. The part that they wanted me to do was all the hugely theoretical, mathematical, we're shooting out laser beams and we want to get all this data back to see what it sees. And I literally had no idea. And I also had no interest. And I also felt a little bit betrayed by the fact that they completely lied about this computer graphics part. So uh, I quit. I dropped out. So you quit the pro master's program? You quit the entire, like just dropped out of school completely? Well, I didn't drop out completely. I stayed on as a part-time student and there were two classes that I was taking that I liked and I wanted to finish. I worked at a phone crisis center Mm -hmm. uh, it was sort of an information slash crisis. Like sometimes people would call up to go like, when's dinner at the dining hall? And then sometimes people would call up and you know, be like, I want to kill myself. So it's, uh, it was sort of an all-purpose uh, phone resource. But that was, I, loved, I kind of liked that job. And so I just, stayed, I just stayed the extra year, but I didn't end up with a master's degree. I agonized over that decision to drop out of my master's program. Really? That, was, that is not something I did lightly, No. Were, because you, were my, your parents upset about that? Well, here's the thing. So my, you know, I'm on a path from childhood that my parents have sort of set for me. And that included getting my master's degree. But yeah, but I knew that I would be disappointing them because this is what they wanted for me. So uh, when I finally came to the conclusion I had to drop out, I, I told my mother and uh, she was very supportive. I wasn't, expect I wasn't expecting that, but she was very supportive. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I can imagine that there's probably a lot of people in the audience that are just like, oh, I wish my parents would be like that. But it just, it makes such a big difference in children's lives when parents are like, you know what? I don't understand this, but you, you love this. You're, you're going to make it into something. As a parent, I've always been that way. I, be, I, I encourage my kids to do what they want to do and to follow their own path. And maybe not as a three-year-old, but uh, later in life. <laughs> <laughs> With the welcome support of his parents, Warren drops out of his master's degree program. But as one door closes, another opens. And he quickly lands a job at the legendary Bell Laboratories. You know, the telephone company named after the guy, Alexander Graham Bell. Bell Laboratories produced some of the most cutting edge technology in the 20th century. Like the creation of the transistor, the creation of the laser, 
the C programming language, which almost every game is based off of, Unix, which is the basis of Linux that is on nearly every server, some pretty foundational stuff for the modern world we live in. I wasn't thrilled about moving out to Illinois, but I did. But I was excited about Bell Labs. The reason I wasn't excited about Illinois in particular is I had interviewed with Bell Labs in New Jersey, which was a lot closer to home. And uh, I think the work they were doing at those locations in New Jersey was a little bit more interesting to me, but I wasn't offered a job there. I was offered a job in Illinois. And the reason I took that job was because they told me it would involve both hardware and software. Now, I was taking a kind of a unique and unusual program at RPI. It was called Computer and Systems Engineering. Well, I mean, computing is pretty young at this point, right? It's like, what, 1979 or something? Well, it's, just, it's mid-70s. I, went to, I started college okay. in 73. And then the job, they said, oh, you'll need hardware and software development. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is what I want to do. So uh, I, was, I was okay with moving out to Illinois, even though I expected to hate it there. Well, turned out I didn't really do any hardware and I didn't really do any software. <laughs> so they put me... <laughs> you're like, hey, man, you're going to do hardware and software. And you get yeah. there, it's like, you're doing none of it. Yeah, right. Other people wrote the software and other people did the hardware design and I wrote the tests. You I, wrote like notebooks of like how to do the tests, right? Yes, right. So at Bell Labs, the, the probability of, of getting their software uh, released like updated and released and, and going live on time was 100%. 100%. It's because you, you, were, you were running QA. That's no, right. that's not why. That's not why at all. <laughs> the reason why it was 100% was because when the day came, no matter what state it was in, it went live. Oh, wow. And if there were problems, then it was QA's problem. It was the people <laughs> who need to maintain it after it goes live. Oh, wow. It's a totally different way of thinking. Oh, my God. It was, it, was, it was insane. It was insane. So they basically said, hey, you're going to be an engineer. You get there. And all of a sudden, now you're like a QA manager, essentially. There were times when I was given on loan to an R&D department. And they were working on what I thought was a super cool project. It was speech recognition, which, again, in the 1970s was kind of like science fiction. So the idea is they wanted uh, to get speaker independent recognition of digits. So if a person spoke digits into a phone, the computer would understand what they were saying. So basically they were using a pattern matching algorithm. And I ended up doing hardware design on the circuitry to actually run the algorithm. So somebody else did the software on that and I did the hardware. So I was kind of like really happy. And I was hoping that I would be transferred permanently to this group because they were doing really exciting things. But they kept on bringing me back to uh. testing. And then, so the, the third time they brought me to testing uh, and I, I was just really over it. And so I, I quit. So you just up and quit, no prospects, no nothing. Yep, totally quit. In fact, I, I kind of was so dis disillusioned with engineering at that point, I thought, I'm not going to go back to engineering. The repeated disappointments with engineering jobs had burned Warren. Imagine if these were your experiences with a career where you were promised to do one thing and then bait and switched into another. What would you do? In Warren's case, he needed to escape. So he moves into downtown Chicago. Being in the Windy City is a great change of scenery, but at the end of the day, he still needs to find a job. And then I just thought, well, okay, I'll, let me get some odd jobs. I'll just get something to make a little bit of money to extend the amount I have in savings. And I, I got a bunch of weird, I, got, I, I worked for Encyclopedia Britannica. You weren't testing there, were you? <laughs> no, no, but I, the, the thing is, I took this job because it did not involve sales. I was like, I don't want to do sales. I'm not a salesman. I was calling people up who had sent in information cards. They wanted to know more about Encyclopedia Britannica. This is sounding a lot like sales. No, that's just it. I wasn't cold calling. These people wrote to Encyclopedia Britannica and said, I want information. This is warm calling. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's, so to me, that's, that's a big difference. Are you calling up somebody at random and saying, I want to sell you something? No, you're calling somebody who asked for information. So I loved this job. It was fantastic. 
No pressure. I'm sensing a pattern here of like, oh, I, I, I like this because I was just talking with people and now you're taking yeah. another job where you're doing something similar. Yeah, that's true. Phone work was in my life. It was in my blood, apparently. <laughs> After a few days, they said, you know, you have a great phone manner. We're promoting you to sales. <laughs> You're like, that's it, I'm done. I quit. That's Cut it, it off. That's exactly what happened. I quit. Warren just can't seem to catch a break here, can he? But it's moments like this that create the resolve needed to become a titan. Jumping from job to job, trying to understand what drives your own internal passion is critical for having the focus to relentlessly work towards a goal. One thing that Warren told me in my time with him was his hobby in theater and how he always wanted to expand on it. Hey, now's as good a time as ever to see if he can apply himself and see what happens. I had done some acting, like community theater and college, but I had no training. And I had no designs to become an actor as a career. But what I did have was an interest of being on stage and being funny. That I felt I could do. So uh, I saw Second City and I, I went up to them and I said, uh, at the box office, I think I just said, where, where do you go to learn how to do this? And they said, well, you go to Players Workshop of Second City on Lincoln Avenue. The Second City is an iconic sketch comedy group based out of Chicago, Illinois, and birthed the careers of many legendary comedic actors like Bill Murray, John Candy, Tina Fey, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Rick Moranis, lots of people. Their satirical social commentary on the political issues at the moment showed that humor could be used as a way to critique public policy Sounds like some other guys I know. <laughs> but it's way outside the scope of this video to convey the influence Second City had on culture, social issues, sketch comedy, TV, etc, etc. Just know that these guys were some of the best in the industry, and that level of performance attracted Warren to pursue these guys. It was tremendous fun. At first I was fine not having a job, and I was taking these improv classes, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll just look for acting work, you know? I had no training, and so yeah, I didn't get any acting work, and I didn't even know the first thing about how to get acting work. Even though Warren realized he would not be a professional actor, the kind of skills he learned about communication, timing, and delivery would be fundamental in shaping Warren Davis as a titan of the industry. It just goes to show that having well-rounded experiences in life can give you unfair advantages later. Now. I never knew that he had improv acting before I sat down and really spoke with him, but there's no doubt in my mind that is one of the key reasons why he was able to handle those pressures of the make it or break it fast paced culture of video game development. I think you're going to see why later in the story why this is important. Keep your eyes on this. But back to our story. Warren is still trying to discover what his career is even going to be. Trying to be a comedic actor isn't providing the satisfaction that Warren wants. And so he goes in search of the next big thing. But I don't think anybody in Warren's position could imagine how big this next step would be. So I spent about three months, you know, doing, you know, odd jobs, whatever I could find. And, uh, and I realized, you know, I'm not making money as an actor. These other jobs are okay. They're giving me a little cash here and there, but, you know, my savings are not going to last forever. I, I said, look, I'm not going to be an engineer anymore. What am I going to do, you know? So I started picking up the Sunday paper and looking through the want ads at the engineering jobs. I'm just saying, well, let me just see. It doesn't hurt to look. It doesn't hurt to look. It was around Christmas, December 27th, 1981. Gottlieb was looking for video game programmers. And I was like, really? I just, I didn't, it never occurred to me that a job like that was attainable. You had to know somebody. You had, I just, I didn't know it was so easy. Oh yeah. Yeah. People make, yeah, of course. Like <laughs> you, you just think when you're young, the, yeah. like entertainment just appears out of the ether and you don't really realize. Well, I think I'm on some level, I realized somebody's making these games, but I was like, they're not just going to let anybody off the street make these games. You gotta, you know, you've got to have some special superpower. Go to school or for it or something, right? So I, I was just stunned that the I even saw the ad. But then I had, it's like, I had promised myself I wasn't going to go back to engineering. I'm like, do I really want to do? And so I honestly wrestled with this. It's, I mean, I can't believe it when I think back, but I actually did wrestle with it. Do I really? And then I thought, you know what? I'll send in my resume and a letter 
And you know what? Uh, you know, if I get it, I get it. If I don't get it, and, and if I get it, I can always turn the job down. I don't have to accept the job. All right, all right, all right. Back up, back up. I know a lot of you out here are like, who's Gottlieb? Now, Gottlieb was a historic pinball company which created innovative pinball machines like 2001, based off of the movie, Black Hole, Spirit. Many of these machines are sought after by pinball collectors to this day. And if you've seen one of these machines, you'll know why. Gottlieb would later go on to creating video arcade machines as the market for this interactive entertainment scene was exploding in the early 80s. This was the right time for Gottlieb to get into the arcade business because of this explosive growth from arcade games like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Space Invaders, you know, gaming brands that are still with us today. Historians would later credit this early 1980s as the golden age of arcades. The skills to create such machines aren't being taught in schools yet. So if a company wants to compete in this space, they had to look for folks with the intuition and creativity that only future titans would possess. Paul ordered to do that. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Warren still needs to land the job, and there's no guarantee that he would even get it. His experience on paper doesn't really say, I'm a video game maker. No matter. Warren would just walk into his interview with that confidence that he's always got, only to be surprised by an unexpected comment from an unexpected person. As I, as I approach the building, this guy, really large guy with a very gruff voice, he's coming out and, um, and he goes, are you here for an interview? And I said, yeah. He goes, uh, watch out for that waxman guy. He can be a real asshole. I'm like, okay, thanks. Good to know. It's an odd thing to happen on the way in. Uh, but I go in and the receptionist, you know, calls in uh, this middle manager. Uh, his name was Bill Jacobs, a very pleasant guy, wearing a suit and tie, very corporate looking. And I thought, oh, I don't like that. But, <laughs> but he, gave, he gives me the tour. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, fairly, it's a small company. There's not a lot of people. Uh, I met engineers. I met artists. Uh, the plant, as I said, was just completely empty. It was a big open plant. They were, uh, at the time, in, uh, just Tim Skelly was finishing up Reactor. Reactor was their first in-house game. And uh, that had yet to come off the uh, production line. So there, nothing was happening in the manufacturing plant. And like I said, you know, hand, maybe 20 people worked there. Not a lot of people at all. So you got in on the ground floor like while they were staffing up. Yes. And the, the last part of my interview was to meet the vice president of engineering, Ron Waxman. This is the final thumbs up or thumbs down guy, right? Well, yeah, he was the vice president of engineering. So uh, I get ushered into this conference room. You know, it's got the, the long table and I sit at one end and I'm just sort of waiting there for a little while. And eventually in comes that same gruff, rotund man I saw outside. He is Ron Waxman. <laughs> so I'm like, OK. And he sits down and he's kind of like this folded arms sitting back and he's always smoking a cigar he always had a cigar what makes you think you can make video games and i'm sitting there i'm like i, I don't know i have no idea if i can do it or not uh, you have a computer at home now this is 1981 not a lot of people had com i certainly didn't have a computer at home and i said uh, no i i use them at work every question just seemed to presuppose that i had no right to be there <laughs> wow and i left and i thought i thought all right well i guess i'm not getting that job whenever it comes time to take a new job and you do the first interview i always feel like most people are really conflicted because it's like you're really deciding where you might spend like the next couple of years of your life i don't remember agonizing about i remember thinking about it of course i would always think is this something i want to do um I tended to be optimistic. I mean, like with video games, it's like, this is an opportunity to make video games, you know? So, that, so that you're was, just like, I got to take this because was where very else am I going to get it? Yeah, Kind of. You know, my experience in college and my experience at Bell Labs, it sort of encouraged me to, to try things. And if they didn't work out, I can always make another choice. I think that's a really awesome mentality to have because I feel like a lot of young people today feel like, oh, if I don't take this job, there's all these things that fall apart. And... Mm. 
the idea of switching jobs is so much effort. So the idea of I got to make sure this job I'm taking is is going to be something that I'm going to be okay with in a few years because it's kind of like moving apartments or something, right? Like you got to get everything put together and uh, you got to pack it up and get some buy some friends some beer so that you can <laughs> go somewhere else. Well, I think it does depend on the individual. You know, I think uh, a person's personality uh, will sort of determine whether they're willing to take chances or if they're not willing to take chances. And my attitude was, if I don't like it, I can quit. And then like, you know, two days later, they offered me a job. (laughs) Wow. It's official. Warren takes the engineering job at Gottlieb and learns their way of creating arcade games from his peers. But what would happen next would cement Warren Davis as a titan of the industry. So when I was first hired, it was like, all right, well, you know, I'm new. I'm not familiar with the hardware, with the software, with the development system. So, you know, there's a process of becoming familiar with everything. And what they did to help me along there is they gave me to another programmer named Tom Malinowski. And Tom was working on a game and they gave me to him uh, as a sort of junior programmer to help out. You know, if he had things he needed that he didn't want to bother with, he gave them to me. So that was something I could sink my teeth into. So, for example, his his game was a superhero game, sort of based on the Superman 2 movie, where Superman battles three Kryptonian villains. But, of course, we didn't have the rights to Superman. Oh, I was about to say, it's like, how, did you already have the rights locked? No, we had no rights. So when um, this Superman game I'd been helping out on, it was actually canceled. They said, okay, well, Warren, you know, your turn now. He's make a game. Just like that, they're like, go ahead. Like, well, that was your, it. Yeah, I had nothing else to do. I mean, I was hired to make games. I worked with a guy. I learned the ropes. Now it's like, okay, make a game. And that's just how they rolled back then, right? Yeah, there was, yeah it was very loose. Uh, Howie uh, and Ron both believed you hire people, that you, you put your faith in them, and you just set them loose. Explore, play. More companies should do that. I kind of agree. It, I mean, it worked, <laughs> it worked in my case. It was like, okay, I make a game. I have no idea what to make um don't tell me this is is this the first game that you make on your own yeah <laughs> what you, and, you did and, not and know you that knock it, knock it, well i know that you worked on some other games but i no, didn't I worked, realize that this i was worked like, on one game for tom malinowski and then it was then my next game was cuber oh my god <laughs> what's that like when you just like oh just do it here and then you're jumping ahead you know that i'm about to make an amazing game i think I, they also I, know out there too <laughs> Yeah, but but I didn't. (laughs) You know, in in the spring of 1982, when I hear I've been working for Gotham for maybe two months, uh, I didn't know I was going to make it. I'm just trying to make a game. That's what I'm trying to do. Our hardware allowed you to, you know, we had a foreground plane and a background plane. The foreground plane, you had sprites that moved around. The background plane was just static. It was just a background. In software, you could flip a bit and it would flip the foreground and background. Khan was playing around with it, and so he had this background, the Escher cube pattern, that was made for him by Jeff Lee, our artist. So uh, when I saw that, I just it was I had this idea. I just thought, oh, that's really interesting. If you if you carved that into the shape of a pyramid, so there's one cube on top, two on the next row, three on the next, and if a ball fell on the top cube, it would have one of two ways to bounce, and that's binary zero or one and and so every time it went down a level it would have one of two ways to bounce and so after eight levels eight bounces you could describe the entire path of that ball in a single bite Uh, of data yeah eight bits so you're thinking like a programmer just like all right how do i make this easy yeah so i had never programmed randomness and i had never programmed anything with gravity and I thought, oh, this is a really interesting exercise. So I asked Jeff to make me a little ball image. And I took those background blocks that Khan was using and I carved them, you know, by creating edge pieces into a pyramid. And um, I programmed a ball bouncing down the pyramid using a random number generator that Tim Skelly gave me an algorithm for a random number generator. And I implemented that and it was and I, I had balls bouncing down this pyramid. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't just that because the whole idea of collision detection, you have to detect the bounce, but then how do you, how do you create that arc? So this is all stuff that I'm just sort of figuring out, and I'm having a blast. This is fun. 
And when I finish this and I have balls bouncing down randomly on this pyramid, people are walking by and they're like, wow, that looks really cool. You should do something with that. So, so what year, what year is this? Like you've oh, it's got still this 1982. It's a, maybe a month later, you know? And I thought, well, I guess the next thing I would need is like a player character and get him hopping around and jumping from cube to cube. I went to Jeff. I said, do you have any characters that I could borrow? Something that you've made? And he had a whole slew of characters that he created. Perhaps for some game that he was envisioning, but he was, he was an artist. And the, the sad truth of Gottlieb was that the programmers were the designers. So he had all these characters, no game for them. And um, I, I, he put them up on a screen one day and with our art tool. And I looked at the one that had a sort of like an oval, orange oval with a big long nose. And, and, the guy, and, and I picked him because he looked a little pathetic. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. I like that for this guy. So I implemented that. I asked him to give me all the angles I needed. And um, I implemented a player character. Now I had a joystick. And, and, of course, I had to rotate the joystick because, you know, he's, he's moving at angles. And um, so now I had that. It's like, okay, I had no plan beyond that. It's still not a game. How am I going to, you know, I had no ideas. And then one day, Ron Waxman, our VP, who you know about now, he would come out like 5 o'clock. He would just sit down behind you as you're working. You know, I hear him breathing behind me. And he's smoking <laughs> a cigar and breathing and... And and then I just hear this voice that say, oh, what if the what if the tops of the cubes change when he lands on them?" I thought, yeah, that's brilliant. That's fantastic, you know. <laughs> and so, I, and then I did that, and then suddenly it was a game. You had a, you had a goal, right? Yep. So, uh, and I just went at it, you know. And then everything evolved. Now Jeff Lee became my collaborator because I trusted him. He, we had similar sensibilities. Uh, you know, he was a, a, a genius artist and he created all these things. So, you know, when the, the thing is, everybody at the office would give me ideas. But, I mean, I was the programmer. If I didn't like them, if I thought they were, even if I thought they were good, if I thought they were too hard, I wouldn't do them. And Jeff definitely had ideas that I did not like or that I thought were too hard. Um, one example would, would be the... Uh, uh, Ugg and Wrongway characters who come in. Because I, I remember Jeff came to me one day. He was like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you had these characters that came in on, on a different plane of gravity? <laughs> so you got one yeah. guy who's like the Yeah, top, you program it. <laughs> this is, so this side of the cube, which is the side, is actually the top of the cube for him. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? It's like, but but the, the crazy thing is, is that that was gnawing at me for day, for days. And then it was in the game. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I always, uh, I always saw myself uh, as the filter for which any ideas would pass through. Um, and, you know, it just, one thing led to another and boom, we had a game. You know, what's pretty crazy to me, the, what you're describing is because you're the implementer because you're the only person that's doing the implementation. Sure, ideas can come through, but you have carte blanche on this game. It, like, that's not something that even, you know, people who have been doing this for 30, 40 years have that level of control, right? Well, that was Ron and Howie. Ron and Howie said the programmers, the designers, and, the, and that they knew, you know, for whatever reason, the game turned out the way it did. And, uh, and it was a very big success for them. In 1983, Cubert was everywhere. There's, there's no question. I mean, Cubert was everywhere. There were, uh, I have articles from uh, USA Today, Glamour magazine. And it's not just the video game magazines. The New Yorker. You know what I mean? Uh, everybody was talking about Cubert in 1983. How did that change your feeling of your own self-worth? Well, like, you don't just make a smash hit and, like, you're like I stayed the same. <laughs> Well, I was glad that it wasn't a failure. I mean, I was like, this is my first game. I'm like, phew, thank God, you know? That was just like a relief. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say my ego was stroked because you, you nobody know. knew who I was. I mean, so I, did it even occur to you that this was like 
not only did it do really well, but it's like, you know, miles above like what most games that are probably oh, considered you know, proper. It was very clear that it was a su- success. It was, <laughs> that was, I mean, that wasn't hidden from me. It was b- very obvious. And know? had they had a success like that ever before? Well, Qbert was only their second game that they released. They released Reactor. The superhero game was canceled. And then Qbert. Oh, so did this set up expectations for everybody? It's like, oh, we're just we're all going to the moon as we keep making more of these. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, the whole business of of the arcade industry is kind of fascinating because you know, Golly was a manufacturer. Their job was to build the game, and they would sell it to a distributor, and the distributors are the ones who care about the coin intake. So that was it. You made the sale, but you didn't get a collection of the coins at all. Like there was no rev share. No, no. We built the machine. Uh, So that's why they merchandise so much because it's the only other way to uh, capitalize on something that was already really successful. That's right. So they're making money off the arcade machines. Don't get me wrong. And the other thing is because, and this is something they learned from decades of making pinball machines. There's ups and there's downs. And when there are ups, you hire more people to keep those production lines rolling. You ramp up production. When there are downs, you have to lay people off. You slow down production, so you're only making you know a fraction of the games per day that you can. And you do that so you can keep as many people on staff as possible. So they knew how to weather storms, you know. Hubert was a huge success for them and um you know that sort of elevated my status in the company you know i i i got freedom to work on whatever i wanted to work on so that was good i i wouldn't say it went to my head i i don't think my ego felt stroked i just felt relieved that that i you know i I get to keep my job yeah kind of (laughs) yeah right and nobody knew who I was. I was completely anonymous. But they were comparing Qbert and Joust because they were both American-made games in a world where most of the hits were Japanese. Williams is probably like the top of arcade uh, American arcade uh, creators at this time, right? Probably, yeah. Defender, Stargate, Robotron, and then Joust. So yeah, Williams was riding high with mega hits, many mega hits, yeah. But when they talked about us at Gottlieb, could not use our names. We all had pseudonyms. And I'm talking about me, Jeff Lee, and Dave Field, who did the sounds. Management didn't want your, your names getting out because right. then someone could hire you. Yeah, because the same article talked about Joust. And all of the people from Williams that were involved with Joust were named. After that magazine article came out about the original Joust and Qbert, we sort of shamed our management. So after that magazine article... They relented, and so everything after that magazine article had credits. The competition between Williams and Gottlieb was fierce. They were the American arcade creators who were going toe-to-toe with the Japanese firms at this time. Gottlieb was standing tall with the mega success of Qbert, easily solidifying Warren Davis as a titan. And all this happened on his first game. Crazy. Still can't believe it. But in 1982, these games weren't seen as the long-lasting franchises that we have today. Warren would go on to keep building games, but the whole arcade industry was changing rapidly. Home consoles like the Atari 2600 are getting price dropped to $99 in 1982, which is about $320 in 2023 today. Pretty competitive pricing for mass adoption. Now, consumers were lured in by the fact that you actually owned the game and could play it as often as you wanted from the comfort of your own home. This would put immense pressure on the whole arcade industry. They needed to figure out the next big thing to outdo home consoles. Where they would go next would lead Gottlieb to financial ruin. In 1983, Gottlieb came out with Mach 3, which was a Laserdisc game. And that was the big craze in 1983 is uh, Laserdiscs, Dragon's Lair came out in the summer. A whole slew of manufacturers released Laserdisc games in the fall, Mach 3 being one of them. And Mach 3 was a huge success. But they knew, as in every game, eventually it stops earning money. And the and these games were expensive, these Laserdisc games, because the engineering of them was expensive. The Laserdisc players were expensive. The production of, of the Laserdisc was expensive. So they had to give the operators a break, the people who bought these machines to put in their arcades or whatever. Uh, and so what they would do is they'd make kits. 
And basically a kit was a completely new game, but you didn't have to buy the cabinet. You just bought the disc, Yeah, you'd leverage the purchase of this hardware by putting in a new game. So uh, Dennis had an idea for a game that could go into a Mach 3 and extend the life of that cabinet once Mach 3 stopped collecting money. It was a science fiction B-movie kind of a thing, uh, and I was all over it because I, I had wanted to be a filmmaker. That was my two choices in high school when I was picking colleges was either study filmmaking or study computers. So, oh my God, that was my decision as a kid. It was like, go to engineering school or be a filmmaker. And I chose to be a filmmaker. Well, you know what? In, in, and now, look how you turned <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, that's all, they're, they're kind of the same thing because computers are so involved in filmmaking. Yeah. But back when I was doing it, it was, you know, it was Super 8 versus, you know. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we came out with this game in the summer of 84 called Us Versus Them. It was, it was poised to be a huge success. Huge success. It was tested. So it was designed to be a kit. But they put it out in, um, in, for test, and it was collecting through the roof. And they, they decided to build dedicated cabinets because the collections were so good. So we all thought we had a hit. But almost immediately, the, the, the laser disc crash happened. This is where people, you know, aside from them being very expensive, they would fail in the field. There were so many problems with laser disc machines in the field that uh, operators were like, we don't want these anymore. What do you mean? They couldn't stand up to kids kicking them when they... <laughs> That's one thing. Heat, dust, and kicking. Yes, those were the three big things. And, uh, you know, the manufacturers tried things about the way they were mounted or they would do... They did all sorts of stuff. Didn't matter. It was too little, too late. And uh, all of a sudden, Laserdisc arcade games were verboten. Gottlieb's distributors had placed orders for tons of Laserdisc games... And Gottlieb was building these games, and their distributors canceled the orders. And Gottlieb ended up suing the distributors, who are their customers. Imagine a business yeah. where you sue your customers. I could think of a couple, the music industry. Yeah. It, it, was, it was not good. Basically, September of 1984, Gottlieb shut their doors. Just We walked into the office one day, and Ron Waxman said to everybody... Pack up, everybody. Doors are closing. We are done doing business. Just like that. Just like that. And this is essentially like a, a crash of video games. I know at home, but there's also an arcade crash. This that is the arcade crash, yeah. And so you're describing living through the arcade crash, but you're just... You know, hey, I'm just an engineer over here. You're probably not thinking of like the finance or politics and everything behind all of this you're just like oh, yeah. i'm just doing my job yeah. you show up like you know things are weird did that change your perspective on how you viewed the industry no not really i i was i i, I was very business ignorant uh when i was younger i i i cared about what i did but i i knew nothing about the business side of things and i didn't really care to know i didn't it wasn't important to me it was bad times it was bad times for everybody so you're out of the video game industry for what, like two years? A year and a half. Year and a half? Mm-hmm. Wow. Never, like, never to know if I was coming back. Did you think at the time, like, okay, that's it. Video games are done. They were done. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> the company was gone. I thought I was going to work the rest of my life at Gottlieb. I just thought that was it. I was a company man. I would be there till I die. That's what I thought. So I worked out of the industry at this other job for about a year and a half. And then out of the blue... I got a phone call from a headhunter. How would you like to come back to the video game industry? Warren would be asked to work for Gottlieb's old-time rival, Williams Electronics. But you probably know them as Midway, the makers of Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, and Rampage. Working for America's number one arcade creator was a no-brainer to Warren, and he took the job right away. Now, throughout this whole episode, you've probably heard us say Williams and Midway interchangeably, But just remember, in 1988, Williams would actually acquire Midway. And due to the success of Midway's arcade games, the Williams name would just be dropped completely. And Midway was used as the name of the arcade division going forward. Either way, when we mention Williams or Midway, they become interchangeable after the 1988 acquisition. 
And when I started at Williams, it was the just coming back from that crash. They had decimated the department. There was nobody there at Williams. There were like three people in the video department. The only game being worked on was Joust 2. And there really wasn't anything for me to work on other than art tools. But it was a good way, again, it was a good way to sort of learn the ropes, get familiar with their processor. They used Motorola processors. What did it feel like being back in the game business? Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. I was like, I loved it. <laughs> I was very happy to be back. What Did that year off from making video games, like, really drive home? I've always been driven by a desire to entertain people. That's, that's a, a big thing of what drives me, bringing people joy through some sort of entertainment. Games was a way to do that. So to be able to come back to video games meant another opportunity to do that. I think Warren underplays just how awesome he is at creating software technology needed for arcade success. He keeps being asked to come into companies on the ground floor and create tools for something that doesn't even exist yet. Coming out of the arcade crash meant that they had to be small and scrappy when coming up with new ideas. Things that Warren had already proven himself to be pretty good at. Now, the Nintendo Entertainment System had just launched in the US and I think it's become pretty obvious now to most folks that home consoles are here to stay. Arcades had very stiff competition from the success of the 2600 and now the NES at home. And arcade makers were convinced that to gain market share, they needed to provide an experience that could not be replicated on the home consoles of the time. Of course, creating powerful hardware that could outdo these consoles was the first thing on their mind the video game industry was going to go from 16 colors to 256, which was the next logical step. And uh, our hardware designer had a, a, a design for a system that would, uh, it was actually supposed to be a multi-planar system, kind of like a, an IBM PC with a cage and slots. And so for every plane you needed, you'd, you'd put a slot in of, of one particular board and you could put multiple, anyway. Uh, that all got thrown out the window when Eugene Jarvis came back because at one point Eugene Jarvis had left to uh, get an MBA uh, well, in that's, California. That's cost. When he came back, he led the video department. And so he was the driving force behind our newest hardware. And we ended up with um, you know, a, a single plane 256 color system. It used a 3410 GPU from Texas Instruments, which was <clears throat> a graphics... CPU, it, it was a CPU that had graphics functionality, but we didn't use any of that graphics functionality because it was too slow for us. <laughs> so Mark Lafredo <laughs> built a proprietary blitting chip, which would push pixels really fast. And that's that was our 256 color system. You know, that's a really interesting thing because when I was doing the research for this and I see a video, I was like, oh, that's why they chose the CPU. It can do graphics and CPU. It must be a cost savings thing. And then you're like, no, we never use it. We never use the damn thing. I'm like, what? We, we, what? We, you know, it was a good idea. We thought it would. We were hoping it would. But it just it wasn't fast enough. And what's interesting is that when you look at a lot of sites that document this stuff, they don't document the custom blitting chip. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to go look in the source code of MAME to determine whether or not, like, oh, wow, there's, there's, what? This isn't part of the CPU. Mm. This is something else. Yeah. And then as they progressed over the years, you know, we would put in more palettes. So now you didn't just have one 256 color palette. You might have 16 possible at the same time. And then so maybe one character would have his own 256 color palette. And this is one of the ways that my work got filtered into the hardware so that you get really kind of cool looking images. The thing about 256 colors is to get photorealism over an entire game, it's still not that much. It's almost like the minimum amount of colors you really need to get something to sometimes be photorealistic right. in some yeah. situations. Yeah, so so um, we had an Amiga, which was a pretty advanced home PC for the time, but it could do a lot of graphic stuff that like an IBM PC just wasn't capable of doing. Somebody had uh, made a digitizer for it and it was clunky and it was, you know, it wasn't really um, ideal for our purposes. You had a point, a black and white, like a, you know, uh, surveillance camera uh, uh, with a color wheel that you either had a motor or you would turn it manually and it would go through uh, 
clear, red, yellow, and green oh, filters. Oh my God, you're scanning it three times. Yeah, so over a minute or so, you are, you know, you're grabbing an image and then the software puts it all together into a full color image. And, you know, it's great, but obviously it's great for a still life of fruit, <laughs> but, you know, not for a, a video game. Not right? for something in motion. Yeah. yeah, but what it did was it, it gave me something to play with so I could start exploring these color reduction algorithms because that's the thing. I needed images that had thousands of colors and I needed to find the best 256 colors. And, and then ultimately what I needed to do is take a collection of images because it's not just one image. You know, if we're doing a character, I need to take every pose and find the best 256 colors to represent that character. So that just, that got me started. I was start, started doing that work. And then um, eventually True Vision came out with a target board and a series of boards of which we used one called the ICB. And this is the Targa, like the Targa file format that most people right. are familiar with. And they were part of AT&T. So it, they, it, there was- I'm a, sensing a full circle here. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I worked at Bell Laboratories. That was before the divestiture. True Vision was a group out of, uh, I think it was called the Epicenter. AT&T Epicenter was a, a, some sort of graphics group. And, um, and then they split off and became their own company, True Vision. And they released uh, the Targa boards and, and, and the related boards. And these are boards that run on an IBM PC. Right. right. Is the IBM PC essentially like the main platform that you're coding and yeah. then shooting the information over to the arcade boards? Yeah. And at Williams, they were using IBM PCs as a um, development system, basically, with an in-circuit emulator that comes out of the uh, ribbon cable, comes out of the PC, goes into where your CPU goes, and you control everything from the PC. So this is a big step forward because you don't have to, you know, adopt another workflow just to get graphics in because you'd have to somehow transfer those graphics to the PC before you could even, you know, put them on screen on the arcade machine. Yes, that is true. You're building a way to digitize computer generate or, or real life images into the computer so that you can put them straight on the on the arcade machine because there's a transfer. It's it's, you know, camera, PC, Arcade well, hardware. At first, it was camera videotape, because you know we're we're filming things that are moving, you know, and you can't point a camera at it yet. That came later. Not live. Yeah. Yeah. But what we started in the beginning, it was, uh, yeah, it was camera to videotape, and then we would have to freeze frame the videotape on the frame you want. Grab that frame. They'd strip it out. It was very labor intensive to get good images. I think NARC, which was the first game that used digitized images at Williams, they cleaned up the digitized images quite a bit. So sometimes, like with the player characters, it almost didn't look digitized because they had been cleaned up. But that still had to have it, it had an improvement and it changed the look of that game. That game was very unique looking for the time. Yeah. And it's, it's the first Williams game that used digitized graphics. And so the name of this tool is called WTARG. Mm -hmm. Why did you name it that? Well, TARG is for Targa and W is for Williams. <laughs> it was that simple. This WTARG tool was revolutionary back in 1987. I cannot state enough how much it was. Because of Warren's contributions to this video scanning technology, games like NBA Jam, Mortal Kombat, and NARC just became possible. These games were important because they brought people back to the arcades again in the 90s because they had lifelike, large graphics of real people that couldn't be replicated by the home consoles at the time. That makes for one hell of an attract mode. <laughs> now that these tools are created, Warren is hard at work with the Midway team to create the next big hit. But things don't always go the way you want them to. The game that I was working on with John Newcomer, it was sort of a modern version of the old tank game which was a top-down, you had two tanks, and you know you would shoot each other. And this was all digitized graphics. John Newcomer had built all these models uh, of trees, of, uh, of stores, of houses, of 7-Elevens and McDonald's, and it looked photorealistic. I mean, it looked beautiful. And the player would drive, not a tank, but a 4x4 flatbed truck with a missile launcher in the in the bed because it's a video game <clears throat> and you're driving with a steering wheel and a and a pedal and then you would stop when you wanted to and launch a missile and then you would steer the missile 
right? <laughs> oh, come on. This sounds cool, this sounds right? right? Yeah, this sounds awesome. And you're fighting tanks. So the game was called USSR. No, no, sorry. USSA. So it was like a meld of USA and USSR. The idea was it was a Russian land invasion. This is 19, what, late 1980s? Cold War, why not? Yeah. And I thought it was coming along really well. Well, you know, there was some political stuff happening. Some people didn't like it. They were vocal. And uh, I didn't see why you couldn't have two games at the same time. We were only working on NARC and, and USSA. Those are the only games we were working on. So, uh, but then I was called in and said, you know, we've decided we're canceling USSA. Okay. W was I stung? Of course. I really thought the game had potential. It was really, you know, looking, I thought, really good. But okay, you know, I'm uh, trying to be a team player. Then there was a little bit of a guffuffle in that I was starting to think, okay, well, what am I going to work on next? So I was trying to come up with game ideas. I had some ideas. And then I was... I was told, I was asked if I'd be interested in doing a football game. And I said, you know what? Actually, no. I, I, I'm not a football fan. I don't really know much about football. Uh, you know, I, it's just my interest does not lie in making a football game. I'll do anything else. But, uh, And then I was called into a meeting with the, president, the vice president of engineering where I was told, Oh, so you were told you were doing a football game, right? <laughs> Wait, no. And I, I was like, well, actually, I was not told that. I was asked, and I said, no, no, you're doing the football game. So that was kind of when I kind of thought, yeah, I think I probably need to go. And it, but I, it, it wasn't like I, I didn't quit in anger or anything, and I didn't just storm out. I, you know, I didn't burn any bridges. I, I loved everybody there, and I understood the business reasons why they were doing what they were doing. I just, I didn't want to do a football game. <laughs> So I left. You know, I've always had this thing where I, I just don't want to be stuck in a job where I'm there like eight hours or more a day doing something I hate doing. If you have no other choices in life, that's one thing. But I guess I always believed there was another choice. And coincidentally, um, Premier Technologies, which was essentially the remains of the Gottlieb pinball department uh, that had been reformed under another name, they decided they wanted to get into the video game industry. So they hired me to develop a video game system and do a game. Premier Technologies was the remnants of Gottlieb. You remember Warren's previous team where they did Qbert and those Laserdisc games? That's them. So quick history lesson. In 1984, the remnants of Gottlieb's pinball assets, including their trademark, were sold to Premier Technologies, where they would continue to create pinball machines. So Gottlieb has this roller coaster history of changing ownership from like Columbia Pictures to Coca-Cola. It's a massive set of squiggly lines that looks like a confusing football play. Oh, maybe that's why Warren didn't want to talk about the football game. <laughs> anyway, what's important here is that Premier Technologies didn't have a video arcade department. And some of the guys there knew that Warren was the guy that could help them get it off the ground. Their first game would be Exterminator. And I'll be honest, I had not heard of this game until Warren mentioned it. But after playing it for some time in an emulator, which is no way to really experience this game, trust me, it has a unique controller that makes the game mechanics work. Exterminator is a frantic wave-based shooter where you play this surreal floating hand that can shoot down what looks like a digitized hallway of bugs and rats and even some toy tanks and beer cans because, well, you might as well clean up all those dirty homes while you're at it. Your goal is to eliminate enough bugs or trash to move on to the next wave, which is represented by another room in the house. I think it's a really unique concept for the game, but I'm also thinking here that maybe it didn't do so well because those bonus rounds have you in dingy basements shooting rats. <laughs> but um, I don't think the theming is the only problem this game would run into. Exterminate had many problems. Some of them were hardware problems that got fixed eventually, but it took a while. The controller was a problem. We had a company design a unique controller that had never existed before, and that had problems that got eventually fixed. They basically cut their losses and said that in the field it was having problems, and they fixed the problems too late. So they said that's the end of it, and then we were in discussions to, to work on a second game. Because now that we fixed a lot of the hardware problems, 
we weren't going to have these problems again. And it's not only just the first game out, but it's the first game that this company is putting together. And yeah, yeah. there's some experienced folks here, but yeah. it's all brand new stuff. Yeah. So uh, we were talking, we were you know in, in talks about what to do as a second game. There was a junior programmer they hired f- to help me out. And apparently he was telling them, oh, you know, I, mean, I can do a game. I don't need Warren to do a game. And uh, so they said, all right, we'll give you a shot. And so they said <clears throat> to me, we won't need you for a second game. And then I was free to go do other things. They never came out with a second game. The demise of Premiere's video game department can't be pinned on any single decision. Getting a video game business off the ground during one of the largest upticks in the home console business would have been a massive feat for any company to pull off. But this just wouldn't be the right mix for Premiere. They would continue their pinball business for a few more years, but sadly, the time for pinball companies would be limited in the 90s. But video games... Yeah, video games would go on for a really long time. With Warren Davis now done with his contract with Premiere, it wouldn't be long before Midway would call him back and say, hey, you want another job? The timing couldn't have been better. It just happened to happen at the right time. And I was like, sure, of course. Were you surprised that they were still using your WTARG tool at the time? Yes. I, well, I was surprised. It didn't surprise me they were using it. It surprised me that they didn't make improvements to it. <laughs> because I had left it in a certain state knowing how much better it could get. And I thought, oh, somebody's going to pick up the mantle and keep improving it. So it's production ready, but you're like, okay, things can be done better for new productions. It's usable, but it's a little clunky. You know, you, you got to freeze frame the, the videotape and then you got to grab that. And, and the fact is there, there had been improvements to the Targa board. So they're faster. The newest ones had chroma key. So there's a lot of things of thinking like, well, you know, there's a lot you can do. But nobody did any of it. So I came back and uh, I was like, oh man, all right, I'm going to pick it up and start making it better. Uh, I helped out with T2. I I joined the team, finished uh, T2. I was able to digitize actual movie clips from the movie and incorporate those. Uh, Were they like super protected, like make you go into their vault? By that time, the movie was already out because the original plan was the movie and the game would come out at the same time, but the the game was late. So, you know, I made my contribution to that game. And then we kept that team together for Revolution X. So the next game we did was Revolution X featuring Aerosmith. And I for that, that game, game. It was awesome. For that game, I did the display system, which I was very proud of because the display system was basically a software that determines what you as the viewer see on the screen. T2 was a side-scrolling multiplanar game. So the display system controlled where you were in the world If you were to put something up on the screen, you give it a world coordinate and it's converted into a screen coordinate. Mm -hmm. The idea was you could could build by placing in in a tool that I created, you could place all of the sprites, billboards, as you will, place them in a world, in a 3D space. And then you could create the camera path, how you wanted to move, that you could create decision points where the camera would stop and give the player an option to go up, down, left, right, forward. I just thought this was very cool. And it was also something that I thought could be used for many other games, uh, but never did. What? <laughs> it just didn't, I left. There was <laughs> Nobody else wanted to use it. But they used WTARG for a lot of different games after right. that. Well, that's because all of those games used digitized images. So WTARG was, uh, was the tool. The games I'm just thinking that just come to my head are like Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam. Yeah, Revolution X, Terminator 2, WWF. Uh, uh, there was a wrestling game in 95. Um, and at that point, I believe, you know, everything was so advanced. Pixel resolution of the screen, we started using higher density monitors. So it was 512 horizontal resolution, not 256. So everything about that game, the graphics looked phenomenal on that game. And, and I think we had like multiple, many uh, 256 color palettes. So like every character might have their own palette. And WTARG had advanced to the point where it had a lot of palette management uh, tools. You know, you basically take a, tell it what images you want and it'll find the best palette for that. And it also had a feature that I thought was pretty cool that basically output everything in source code format so you just include it with your source code, and it's, then it's boom, it's in the game. Oh, so it was just its own separate module, so mm-hmm. that when you needed to compile it in, it was yeah. just callable. 
yeah, you just bring it and put it all together with everything else and poof, goes in the game. The way that you did graphics back then is a lot different. Y'all had like four to six months to turn some of these games around. Well, but once we're in the 90s, it, it was probably more like a year, honestly, or maybe even more than a year, you know. But that's still an insane amount of time, especially when you think of today, a game probably takes someone like three to five years to put out. Mm, well, it's okay. more, it's, it's like, <laughs> you know, people have children and they grow up a couple years now by the time they ship a game. Well, you know, it is what it is. It's a different scale. Yeah. Every time Williams put out a game, all these games you're talking about, these are these are heavy hitters. These are the games that people still play today, not out of nostalgia, but because they're pretty awesome games, even still I mean, today. I mean, Williams was an unbelievable place. It was a powerhouse. I mean, in the 90s, late 80s to 90s, just crazy. I mean, they 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 put out like incredible stuff. Every we were just trying to make the coolest shit. That's all everybody was trying to do. In the early to mid 90s, Midway was on fire. <laughs> Sorry, Tim, I just can't do it as good as you. You know, releasing hits like Total Carnage, T2 Judgment Day based off that Terminator 2 movie, Revolution X, Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, MK2, MK3, Cruise in USA, that list goes on and on. You might think that between creating Qbert, one of the most iconic video games created during the golden era, and then building up that tool set that set up Midway to be that powerhouse in the early 90s meant that Warren was just sitting on millions. But no, sorry man. In this industry, it's not uncommon for folks to create amazing things as a work for hire and then only take home that salary and nothing else. <laughs> Why aren't you rich, dude? You've done amazing stuff. Uh, what, what's, what's, what's money going to do? Did you ever think of what you would do if you just you know, made it rich off of one of these games, would you go do your own game studio or would you still continue? Kind of Probably like not. I, I was actually a venture capitalist. Um, once asked me, he had like millions of dollars he wanted to invest in something. And he asked me if I wanted to head up something and I, I turned him down. I just didn't want that kind of responsibility. I didn't want that kind of pressure. You wouldn't feel like you'd be a maker. You'd be a manager at that point. I think in that case, I would have definitely been a creative force. But that does involve management. Yeah, you know? especially if you're the, the point person with VC. Yeah, and, and, and if you're responsible for the money. It's a pressure. It's a pressure that um, I've been happy to avoid. Warren would later go on to work for Disney and Industrial Light and Magic doing what he does best, making tools for groundbreaking games. I could have spent a whole day interviewing Warren on his further contributions to the industry, but unfortunately, there just wasn't enough time. He told me that a lot of things are covered in his book, so you should take a look at the link below if you want to see how the story ends up. But our story here continues. As the era of the video arcade gave way to home consoles and the growing PC market, the business would change drastically, forcing gameplay to change drastically as users wanted deeper and longer experiences. Now, Warren would be there to see the industry he was familiar with morph into an even more complex beast. And while Warren still freelances to this day, I think it's out of love for the craft, not because of some necessity to work. He still got that Titan spirit and would be working away on the next piece of entertainment, but he's doing it on his terms now. Still, if you get to create one cultural icon with staying power for multiple generations, that's a great job. But then being able to contribute to those key Midway franchises that still influence us today makes him a titan of the industry in my book. If you could go back and tell a young Warren Davis, mm. fresh out of college, oh boy, what's the thing that you would advise yourself? Oh my God, I don't know. Do the football game. <laughs> no, that's I'm totally, that is totally not true. What I tell myself, I don't know. Have fun. But I kind of did that, so I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't have very many regrets, you know? I mean, I do have some, but I don't have a lot of regrets, and they're certainly not deep regrets. I feel like I've been very fortunate in my life. Uh, I feel like uh, I've been blessed in a lot of ways. What drove me was a desire to 
entertain people, is to try to you know, just bring joy into people's lives. I, that, that is a, a powerful force for me. I think joy is a powerful force. I think you know, we could use more of it in the world. And um, um, anything I could do to help that along, I feel good about. When you advise other folks, I mean, there's people that probably come to you and, and ask you for advice or, or mentorship or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. What's, what's, what's the advice you give there? I usually advise people to stick to their visions, you know, to hold a place where they can do the kind of work they want to be doing, to not, to not feel pressured by other people to do things that they don't want to do. I try to give people the advice to not be dicks. Don't be a dick, you know? What's next for you? So I have some theater projects coming up. I'm going to be doing a, a sound design for a, a new uh, play that's going to be done in Chicago in the fall and uh, act in a variety of small films. And um, I work with um, Mike Farrell, who does a one-man show. It's about a scientist who discovered that CO2 levels were rising all over the planet since, the, you know, in the 1950s. I always have projects. I do play readings. Tomorrow I'm doing a talk on uh, the Laserdisc debacle of 1984. Talk at retro convention. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I do. I actually have a few retro. Last year I did so many. And then, and I just said, I can't, I can't keep up that schedule. It was just so much. But um, yeah, I do have a couple of retro gaming conventions coming up this year as well. Warren, if anybody wants to find out more about your life, I hear you have a book. That's true. Yeah. The book is a good place to go. Uh, <laughs> don't go to Wikipedia because you won't find it. Did I ever tell you the whole thing about Wikipedia? <laughs> I tried looking you up on I, that. I was like, why can I not find information on this? I used to have a page on Wikipedia, and, and then they and took then it away. Editors. They took it away, and they point you to the Qbert page. No. Which, which is, come on. you know, has some inaccuracies. They took away my page for some reason. I have no idea why. But they can go get your book. They can get my book. Anybody can get my book and then start their own Warren Davis page on Wikipedia. And you can cite the book because that's the thing. Wikipedia says it doesn't matter if something's true. It only matters if it's verifiable. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I would love for people to go out and find my book. It's called Creating Cubert and Other Classic Arcade Games. Uh, it covers my entire arcade career, which is from about 1982 to 1996. I mean, I continued to have a career in the home market. We haven't talked about any of that, and that's fine. Uh, I get tired of talking about myself, but someday maybe I'll write a, a sequel that uh, talks about those years. Where can we go to get that book? You should be able to get that book, uh, Creating Cubert, anywhere online, any online bookstore. Uh, if you have a favorite independent bookseller, you will probably be able to order it online through them. I'll drop a link in the bottom. Yeah. If anybody wants an autograph copy, then uh, I do offer those on my personal shopping site. We'll put a link on that too. Great, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Warren. My pleasure. And that's our interview with Warren Davis. You know, I, I found it really interesting hearing about his rise as an engineering student only to be sidetracked by some poorly managed projects. And I think the lesson here is to be transparent with your workers because you don't know which ones are gonna have the tenacity and the drive to push the next innovation in your company. Also, I found his experience learning improv was probably key for his communication skills that allowed him to move in and out of companies instead of being stuck on jobs that he didn't really want to do. And also, it made for a pretty fun interview, don't you think? What lessons did you learn from Warren's experience? I'm, I'm sure there's more to read into here, and if you have another titan of the industry you want me to interview next, drop a name down there in the comments too. Until next time, I'm Alexander Mejia, and this has been Human Interacts, Titans of the Industry.